Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I've entitled this series of lectures Artistic Revolution in Modern Jewish Life because my purpose is to explore the intricate interaction that has evolved over the past 200 years, maybe even longer, between the acculturation of Jews to modern society, especially in Europe, their self-perception of the process, and the ways in which it has been conceived by the societies they inhabited. The process itself of acculturation is the background to the lectures, but it's not their focus. The heart of the lectures relates to the ways in which the process was configured in the minds and imaginations of Jews and non-Jews. Imaginative depictions have often had the power, consciously and subconsciously, to impact the historical development while offering a gloss on the phenomenon itself and constituting a central element of the cultural developments. Each of the themes that I will treat in this series of lectures with a variety of visual material enables me to enter into subtle formulations of the problematics of Jewish vis visibility in the modern period and to highlight the dialectical process of a minority's acculturation, the drive to become part of the host society together with the persistent desire to preserve and showcase its unique contributions and developments. Some of the visual material that you will see during these lectures was created by artists of Jewish origin, some by non-Jews who showed an interest in Jewish life and some of the personalities who will be discussed. But I should say from the outset, if you're thinking that you're going to be hearing about Marc Chagall, Pizarro, and some of the other great Jewish artists, you'll be disappointed. Because what I'm interested in is looking at figures and problems that did not necessarily concern some of the more great, so to speak, Jewish artists. Now, as I'm saying this, I want you to be aware of the fact that this is an issue which becomes very important in the problematics of Jewish acculturation. But I want to say something about the picture that you see in front of you, the picture of Moses Mendelssohn. Before this, a small comment. In a work which dealt with the issues of race, war, slavery, and monuments in the 19th century, America, Kirk Savage, a historian, summarized the, imag the imagination of the emancipation of the slaves with the following remark. And this is important for me in this series of lectures. To, emancip to imagine emancipation, he said, was to imagine Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. I would say, mutatis mutandis, in a different context, that to imagine the Jewish Enlightenment was for the most part to imagine the philosopher Moses Mendelssohn, who was born in 1729 and he died in 1786. Here you see Mendelssohn in an attractive oil painting on wood by a distinguished portrait artist by the name of Anton Graf, who came to see Mendelssohn in 1771. He came to Mendelssohn's house, not maybe knowing that two years after a very difficult moment in Mendelssohn's life had had developed, and that was a confrontation that he had, in, and we'll come back to this confrontation, with a Swiss theologian by the name of Johann Caspar Lafater. In that confrontation, Lafater turns to Mendelssohn, or basically expects Mendelssohn to read a work that he sends to Mendelssohn, and he hopes that Mendelssohn will read it and then convert to Christianity. Now, in this portrayal of Graf, we may intimate, we may see something of the fact that Mendelssohn had a hunchback. But we see a very affable individual whose intelligence and wisdom engage the viewer's interest and attraction, and thus this was something which he wanted to show. He wanted to show us Mendelssohn's forehead, 
because he wanted to, sh to give centrality to the, to the wisdom of this man. Indeed, when we turn to look at the visual representation of Mendelssohn and the Enlightenment over time, it seems clear that artists of different origins and countries looked for ways to assimilate Mendelssohn into one tradition or another, one history or another, one vision or another, creating associations based on fact or imagination, on intentions or perceptions. And each image reveals that its author is making a statement far beyond the image we encounter. Though we are looking at Mendelssohn, we are often given hints to look not only at him, but in other directions, some of which I hope to explore with you this evening, for whereas ideas may avoid exact definition, the image may be able to distill all the complexities that constitute a specific historical period, as a great thinker, Walter Benjamin, wrote in the 1930s. It is clear then that when we look at the human body, we have to be thinking also that the human body is an image of society and it cannot be considered without its social dimension. This was surely true with regard to the imagination of the emancipation of the slaves in America. And I would argue also in the case of the impressive array of images that incorporated, depicted, or referred to the figure of Moses Mendelssohn. His visual persona offers more than a simple code to the daunting historiographical concern with Mendelssohn since his death. And if you would look at the bibliographical treatment of Mendelssohn, there's an endless flow of biographies and, and studies of Mendelssohn and a work written almost 50 years ago, but that was not the only one, always sees the beginning of modern society with Moses Mendelssohn. And so it would appear that Mendelssohn stood for many as the symbol of the modern period in Jewish history. His visual dimension has remained as well, a constant preoccupation since his lifetime, eliciting memorial plaques, exhibitions, and even a volume of his writings includes visual domain. No Jewish figure, I would claim, maybe outside some of the biblical figures, attracted such visual attraction. Neither Benedict Spinoza, who we will have time to talk about in the fourth lecture, nor the uh, very problematic figure of the 18th century by the name of Yudzis Oppenheimer, who maybe some of you have heard about the Nazi film that was done about him, Mendelssohn was truly concerned, or people were concerned in trying to depict what this person looked like. He is generally considered the father of the Jewish Enlightenment. He had many distinguished figures around him. And an age in which the issue of physiognomics was at its height, it penetrated into many corners of philosophic thought and aesthetic appraisal. Prominent individuals of letters and thought wanted to talk to Mendelssohn. Interest in his appearance was also related to the fact that people wanted to assimilate his unique prominence among the German literati with the overriding negative view of Judaism. So Mendelssohn was not simply the renowned Jewish philosopher whose philosophic works were praised by leading intellectuals of the day, but also a man whose con whom contemporaries acknowledged as one who rose far above his co-religionists and did not share with them their debased traits and characteristics. Let me bring you a quote from a woman in 1785, the year before Mendelssohn died. She wrote in her diary, the conversation became very interesting and I feasted my eyes in seeing the amiable philosopher 
with the Jew's beard, and you can see the very slight beard here in Graf's painting. And, you can, and she continues that you see the amiable philosopher with the Jew's beard engaged in talk with some charming ladies. In the age of growing intimacy, Mendelssohn was un not unaware of the interest that people had in his physical appearance. And I mentioned before, and keep this in mind, he was a hunchback. And he was willing to sit before different artists. And Mendelssohn was an orth what we would call today an orthodox Jew. He was observant. He did not drink wine that was not made by Jews. And even though he had very warm relations with very important figures like the great thinker Gottfried Ephraim Lessing, people recognized and maybe felt this was very strange that here was a man of such great intellect that he maintained a very strict orthodox way of living. And so Mendelssohn knew that people wanted to see him. He was even willing to have people come and to portray him, as did the pe person that you have in front of you. Moreover, as Mendelssohn was in a physical situation, not a very positive one towards the end of his life, his companions turned to a very important Belgian-born sculptor by the name of Jan Pieter Tassert, and they asked him, maybe you should say, we, they commissioned him to create a work that would symbolize the unique place Mendelssohn held in their lives and in the world of the Enlightenment. Now, Mendelssohn was willing to be sculpted. Now, keep that in mind. We're speaking of, a, of an Orthodox Jew. Now, they believed that Berlin Jews' wealthy elite, 20 individuals, each contributed a sum, a very high amount of money, 20 dollars in gold, to have this sculpture, which is unfortunate. What you're seeing here is only a remake of the original sculpture. But there are features in the sculpture that you see which very much represent what the original sculpture wanted to express. Each of the people who gave money to have the sculpture commission, had the sculpture made, was going to be able to have a separate sculpture in plaster for their own private residence. Now think about this for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. What pictures do you keep in your home? What sculptures do you keep in your home? Who do you want to have that will remind you of the past, maybe? And so here are these people feeling that we're dealing with a figure who was so important for them. Tassert finished the sculpture in 1785. And what do we see here? We see here Mendelssohn in classical attire, emphasizing the common epithet which people used when they spoke about Mendelssohn. He is the Jewish Socrates. Though according to his first biographer, Isaac Eichel, Mendelssohn was not known for donning elegant clothing, but Tassert created the sculpture in a classical model. He is dressed in a cape, the long, familiar, generic device of portrait sculpture, common from classical portraits and sculpture. We can see that Mendelssohn has here a beard, very apparent. His gaze is very much to the people who are looking at him, and his wrinkled face much more dramatically shown than than we saw in the painting by Graf. On its creation, Mendelssohn's followers had the bus placed in the offices of a free, of a Jewish free school in Berlin, which was of the Enlightenment agenda. And even though it was not fully in accord with Mendelssohn's own beliefs, they decided that they wanted to have the bust in that 
in that school because the desire of his followers was clear. They wanted to emphasize Mendelssohn's identification with their cause and utilize his reputation as an acculturated Jew to encourage others to follow suit. Here, of course, a commonplace phenomenon emerges in the process of representation. A person's memory, and think of this for yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, a person's memory, an image, is invoked for purposes and ideologies that are not necessarily commensurate with those upheld by the individual concerned. In other words, you may have in your home pictures of a great figure, maybe even the picture of the, the uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe. Now, it could be that the Lubavitcher Rebbe was happy if you had his picture in his house because he in your house because he believed that the his picture also in some way presented something to the people who would want to see him so in choosing to a sculptor to memorialize mendelssohn the patrons could not have been oblivious to the cultural implications they were making a statement vis-a-vis -vis the traditional principles of the community Several of the patrons had sculptures in their own homes and they were not perturbed by the traditional normative behavior in, in Jewish life that frowned upon creating or collecting sculptures. And after Mendelssohn's demise, they had somebody uh, write something which you cannot see in the image that you have in front of you, someone who wrote a text which would, was added to the sculpture saying, Moses Mendelssohn, wise like Socrates, loyal to the faith of his fathers, like him he taught immortality, and we will come back to the fact that Mendelssohn wrote a book on the issue of immortality, and he immortalized himself like him, like Socrates. This inscription accepted the duality of Mendelssohn's life completely and did not place his achievement in contrast to other Jews. And I would say that because of this, the sculpture went through various cha changes over time. But let me return now to the images of Mendelssohn during his lifetime. That Mendelssohn's countenance was viewed in, in contrast to typical, typical images of Jews is most evident from his counterpart that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, Johann Caspar Lafeter, the Swiss theologian. Now this Swiss theologian, who was very widely known for his work on issues of the physiognomy, a book that he wrote in, um, went through 55 editions in several languages since it was first published in German in 1775. And this work contributed remarkably to the development on the orientation of physiognomy. In his words, the goal of an image of an individual was to pierce through all these coverings, rank, condition, habit, estate, dress, and to discover in these foreign and contingent determinations solid and fixed principles by which to settle what the man really is. It was this need to examine to the bottom a characteristic face that Lafater believed that every trait carried the inscription of an internal quality. So when we're looking now at a silhouette that appears in his discussion of uh, issues of physiognomy, he claimed that the image of God and physiognomy recognition is the product of a metaphysical or religious epiphany. And so we now look at what he brought when he brought this silhouette of Mendelssohn. Now you keep in mind what you saw before. And now we see what Lafeter also says. Supposedly, supposedly you know this silhouette. I can hardly conceal from you it is, it is exceedingly dear to me, most expressive. Can you say, can you hesitate a moment as if wanting to say, 
perhaps a fool, a vulgar, a tactless soul? One who could say a thing like this or could bear another saying, so should look, so should close my book, throw it away, and permit me to stop thinking lest I pass judgment on him. I, Lafaterre is saying, I revel in this silhouette. My glance welters in this magnificent curve of the forehead, down to the pointed bone of the eye. The depth of the eye, a Socratic soul is lodged. The firmness of the nose, the magnificent transition from the nose to the upper lip. Now this is Lafaterre describing what, how he sees Mendelssohn's silhouette, the height of both lips, neither protruding beyond the other. Oh, how all this chimes with one another to make the divine truth of physiognomy perceptible and visible to me. Yes, I see him, the son of Abraham, who someday in unison with Plato and Moses will recognize and worship the crucified Lord of glory. <sighs> the crucified Lord of glory. The unity that he sees and that he hopes will happen, transpire with this figure is that Greeks and Jews will, you, will all unite under Christ. The Socratic comparison appears here together with the notion that Lafaterre here sees here the divine truth of physiognomy, perceptible and visible to him. He clearly intimates that the image of Mendelssohn is unlike those of his fellow Jews. He is a rare individual whose character, whose physiognomic character stands out as if his figure emerged from a wholly different soul from the rest of his fellow Jews, as if his figure emerged from a wholly, emerged at, from most of other Jews. And Lafaterre was thus clearly daunted that such a figure should remain outside the confines of Christianity. Yet he was not alone in trying to assimilate the image of Mendelssohn with the stereotypical image of Jews and Judaism. Now, when Mendelssohn dies in 1786, an unidentified memorial page appears which shows Mendelssohn being brought by angels to a plateau. This is not done, of course, by a Jewish artist. But you can see Mendelssohn being brought by angels to a plateau with a halo-like background upon which three biblical figures, all with shaggy long hair and unkempt beards, are standing. Abraham is in the center. Moses to his right and Aaron to his left appear in this trinity. Now Mendelssohn's beard is trimmed, as is commonly seen in his various portraits, and his physique is rather slim, with no clear sign of a hunchback. He is wearing a long cape, and the text at the bottom relates to the fact that all three figures turn with happiness to greet the new figure. Though the joint presence of Moses and Aaron is, is very common in Jewish and Christian iconographic tradition, but this is not the case with regard to the three figures we see here. This is exceptionally rare to have together these figures. Of course, we know that the, the evangelists see Moses as a progenitor of Christ. But Abraham, pivot in the, in the center and above the others, is recognized in Christian tradition as the father of all believers, destined to inherit the divine promises. And since Abraham is often combined typologically with Christ, it could possibly be interpreted that Christ takes Moses and Aaron, Judaism, under his wings, and together they welcome Mendelssohn, the philosopher who had concerned himself with the nature of monotheism, to join them. 
Lafater then had mentioned that he had hoped that Mendelssohn, the son of Abraham, will together with Plato and Moses recognize and worship the crucified Lord of glory. Here the figures are all from the New Testament, from the Old Testament, intimating that Mendelssohn was worthy of joining the galaxy of these great seminal figures of the past and that he possessed a special light that could be added to theirs. Now this concern with who Mendelssohn was appears also in, in a medal which was created during Mendelssohn's life by a medalist of Jewish origin. And here we see Mendelssohn appearing in the medal. And you can see that it's a very distinguished image of Mendelssohn. And um, it is on the obverse, we have the image of Mendelssohn with the image of Phaidon. Now, this was a philosophical work which Mendelssohn wrote dealing with the immortality of the soul. And the butterfly was commonly depicted as Greek imagery to depict the soul. And the book which Mendelssohn wrote called Phaidon was very much accepted by leading scholars of the period. And then you have a work which of Mendelssohn again. Now look at this figure of, of Mendelssohn. And this was a, a figure created again by, commissioned by non-Jews, commissioned by Jews from a non-Jewish artist to present Mendelssohn as a gift to Friedrich Wilhelm in 1787, a year after Mendelssohn died. In other words, the Jews are thinking that we can use the representation of this great figure to help ourselves acculturate into society. And one further example that I would bring to you during or at the time of Mendelssohn's death. Now you're seeing Mendelssohn in different versions. Here we see Mendelssohn on the cover of a very important, a very important Enlightenment, Jewish Enlightenment publication called Hame'asef, the collector. And this was at the beginning in 1786 and for several years the journal was in Hebrew, later it is in German. And on the cover of the first issue of Hamas Seif, we see an engraving of Mendelssohn. Now, notice the owl in the corner, a symbol of wisdom and rationalism. And again, we see a very um, modern looking Mendelssohn, though he still has the very slight beard, not clear whether he is here seen with a wig. And again, the forehead is given extreme importance to emphasize the fact that we're dealing with a very important figure. And once again, we should say that one is using the image of Mendelssohn to associate with an educational purpose of the Enlightenment. Now, let me show you another example of something which was published, which is rather strange, maybe. Take a look at this for a moment and think what you are seeing. Who is the short figure? The short figure is Moses Mendelssohn. And this is a work by a, a Protestant uh, figure by the name of Daniel Horowiecki, who is a man of wonderful talent. He was born in Danzig to Huguenot parents. And he moves to Berlin in 1743 to pursue his father's business and family's financial situation. And Chodowiecki uh, came into contact with Jews in Berlin and was very aware or had heard that there is this person by the name of Moses Mendelssohn. And in the presence of a Jewish milieu of of, of literal figure, of socialites and business people, 
And um, he wrote of the Berlin Jews, this artist, in 1783, the following. It seems that where you live, the Jews are still orthodox. Here, with the exception of the lower classes, they are so, but by no means. They buy and sell on Saturdays, on Shabbatot. They eat all forbidden foods. They don't keep fast days. But Mendelssohn continued observance, and that was foreign to Cholowiecki. And he wrote to a friend in 1771, I've begun to create the portrait of the Jew, Moses. And we'll come back to that portrait in a moment. Now, what is done here? We have here a, an, a, an illustration of Mendelssohn, the short Mendelssohn, standing near the gates of Potsdam. The meeting apparently took place in 1771, but I won't go into the entire story, which is very interesting. But I will quote from the great biographer of Moses Mendelssohn, Alexander Altman, who wrote it the following. The scene at the palace gate at which the stocky, hunchbacked philosopher had to present a letter of invitation to the tall officer in charge before being admitted. And this has been immortalized in the work by Chodowiecki. And it has been re reproduced again and again. The truth is, Mendelssohn thought that he was going to meet the Prussian king. Now, keep this in mind, ladies and gentlemen, because later on I'm going to show you an imaginative creation that Mendelssohn actually does meet the Prussian king, which actually never happened. So you can see here that there was great interest in the fact who, what Mendelssohn looked like. This is not a very positive appreciation of Mendelssohn. The full standing image of Mendelssohn shows him to be less than the ideal figure of the Enlightenment aesthetics. And the event is, uh, so to speak, is depicted here. It transmits Chorowiecki's desire to portray the philosopher as he saw him, realistically. And this is interesting. Chorowiecki saw Mendelssohn differently from the others, and he didn't try to create an ideal figure. He himself wrote, for the sake of this resemblance, the ugliness of the features will be knowingly put up with. They will be more than offset by the spiritual energy of the expression. Now, there's no wig, no attempt to idealize Mendelssohn's external features, his rather scraggly hair, thick lips, protruding jowls and cheeks, and his large nose. Yet Mendelssohn himself, interestingly, responded positively that he thought that what Chorowiecki portrayed was la nature, that this was natural. And eventually the image that Chorowiecki depicted, which we will see later, was copied by others and chosen by Joseph Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn's, one of Mendelssohn's children, as the frontispiece to the collected works of his father. And this was later on. Now, when I speak of the iconization, creating an icon, which is not a very Jewish phenomenon, but in a sense, in the modern period, Jews looked for icons. Let me give you an example. Take the example uh, Take the example that you see in front of you. This is based on a, something which Korowiecki had done. And you see here an engraving of, which, was, which was added to a work by a very close um, colleague of Mendelssohn by the name of Marcus Hertz, who wrote a book dealing with um, early burial of Jews in 1788. And the engraving here was, was created to, 
you see as if someone is standing next to Mendelssohn's grave. It's a Jewish graveyard with, a, with tilting gravestones. And the slim figure who is standing there is standing near the graveside of Mendelssohn, whose, whose uh, name is inscribed in garbled Hebrew. You can see then the story comes very close to the one that Mendelssohn brought in a, in a letter that he wrote to Jacob, to Rabbi Jacob Emden, to substantiate his position on accepting the authority's concern for postponing early burial. Now, I won't go into the halachic issues, the, the Jewish ritual issues on early burial, but in a sense, what you see here, again, is an attempt to associate Mendelssohn with a, a new direction in the attitude towards orthodoxy, that one could postpone burial, which was not accepted by the great rabbinic figure of the 18th century, Jacob Emden, who, who chastised Mendelssohn for it. So in a sense, by creating this visual image of having a figure standing before Mendelssohn's grave or Mendelssohn's um, uh, um, be, be, be before Mendelssohn's, next to the graveside of Mendelssohn, you can see that the artist and probably the person who commissioned this wanted to associate, continue to associate Mendelssohn with this new phenomenon. And let me bring you one other example. Now, what do you see here? Now, this is very strange. And I'm thankful to a colleague of mine from the Hebrew University who, who once found this. Here you see Mendelssohn so to speak, but it's not really Mendelssohn. You see two figures hugging each other. And they're hugging each other in the, in the other world. This is based on a book which was published in Vienna in 1793. And you remember that Mendelssohn died in 1796. Mendelssohn had been in clash with several important rabbinical figures. And one of them was the venerable chief rabbi of Prague, Yecheska Landau, who had passed away in 1793. And here you can see two figures hugging each other. The one in the black cape is Mendelssohn. And it's as if Landau, who has now entered the other world, sees Mendelssohn and he hugs him. And this goes back to a controversy which had existed between them in which Landau strongly opposed some of the Enlightenment directions. But now, because one can imagine and reconstruct the past, the devotee is trying to say something else. The hugging jester is in a way to say that here Landau came, saw Mendelssohn, and kissed him with all of his strength. So. Their imaginative meeting in the other world was an expression of the harmonizing tendency that was present in Haskalah, the Jewish enlightenment in Hungary. And um, one can continue. But I want to come to something which develops later on, years after Mendelssohn has died. OK. Now, we're moving into a different world. We're moving into a world in which a Jewish artist, and here I would say a Jewish artist, by the name of Moritz Oppenheim, probably known to many of you who have seen works by Mendelssohn in Jewish museums and other places. Oppenheim was born in 1800, and he died in 1882. And you're looking at sketches which Oppenheim was thinking of already in the 1850s. Now, 1850s, before he creates the oil painting. Now look at these two different sketches that he does. You have one in which you see two people seated. And think to yourselves, which one is Mendelssohn? 
and who's the other figure? You're seeing, you're seeing the room with a library, and you're seeing a person who may probably you think was Mendelssohn. In other words, the one who is sitting with his hand on the table, and there's his hand on the book, is Moses Mendelssohn. The other figure who is holding Mendelssohn's hand, or is touching Mendelssohn, is the controversial figure, Johann Caspar Lafater. And you can also see that Lafater has put his um, umbrella on the side. So he's come to Mendelssohn's house, which indeed he did come in 1763, 1764, before he wrote this very, very controversial note to Mendelssohn, hoping that Mendelssohn will convert. Now look to the other side. You see that there's a different way that Oppenheim is trying to portray what is happening. You obviously can see that Lafater has put out his hand. He's touching Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn's thinking. But then there's, there are two other figures. One who is standing very proudly looking at Lafater. And you see in the background a woman who is possibly about to enter. Here Mendelssohn has a skull cap, kippa, on his head. Now, what is what happens to these sketches when Oppenheim actually turns to do this? Now, this is a very well-known painting which was done in 1856 by Oppenheim. Now, you've seen the change, what's transpired. Okay, so what's happening here? You, can, uh, you, can, you already know, because you've been attentive, I hope, to what I've been saying, the person who's come in, and you can look at his feet, the way he is sitting, Johann Kasper Lafater has come into Mendelssohn's house, has brought a book with him, and without even knowing Mendelssohn personally, he's touching Mendelssohn. But he's also put his hand on a book, the book which Lafater had sent to Mendelssohn in 1769. Now, this is a painting from 1856. Now, you get a sense here, and of course, what is interesting is why this Jewish artist has gone back, found out about this controversy that was so important in Mendelssohn's life, and in the middle of the 1850s feels that it's important to create a visual, historical interpretation of the painting. Now, I could ask you, and I won't be able to unfortunately hear your answer, who is that figure standing with his hand to his side, looking somewhat, I think, quite critically at Lafater? Was he actually present? Now, remember, this was a meeting which took place. In other words, what Oppenheim has done, because the, histori the, the artist doesn't have to do with the historian. The historian has to be careful in terms of bringing his evidence. The artist doesn't have to be. So what do we have here? We have here the very close friend of Moses Mendelssohn, Gottfried Ephraim Lessing, standing looking at Lafater, basically saying, what are you doing? You are trying to convince Mendelssohn? This is not part of rationalism of the Enlightenment. We were engaged in a serious game of chess, the game of rationalism. You have come, you've pushed aside our game of chess 
and you've entered into our home, into our context. Now, this meeting never took place. The three of them are never together. But it's the imagination of the artist. He has Lessing very proudly standing just before this large library of Mendelssohn. And you have probably Mendelssohn's wife feeling that notwithstanding the fact that he has come in, barged in, you could say, and trying to convince Mendelssohn that he should read this book and maybe convince him to convert to Christianity, she's bringing in some something to drink, uh, maybe even something to have a bite on. And what you can't, maybe you can possibly see that on the, uh, on the door, above the door, um, there is a Hebrew uh, saying um, which relates to the fact, um, I can't read it from here, unfortunately, uh, but it's, it's, it's important in terms of the statement that Oppenheim is trying to make. Now, this is 1856. This is a very important time in Moritz Oppenheim's attitude towards Jewish life. And then you see something else. Now, here comes another artist of Jewish origin who's done almost nothing on Jewish life by the name of Louis Katzenstein. In 1865, several years after Mendelssohn's painting, he obviously has come into contact with Mendelssohn's painting. And here we see a very different situation. It's Mendelssohn who is now speaking. And he is now without a skull cap, which we saw before. And I'm going to show you in a moment the two pictures together. But before I show you that, you can see what he has done. He's recreated the scene. Now, once again, the artist, not like the historian, doesn't have to say, oh, I've taken Oppenheim's painting and I've changed it. I've put Mendelssohn in the, as the figure who is speaking. And I have put Lafaterre on the other side, his hand on the book that he had brought. The chess is less significant. And of course, we look at, Lafayette, at Lessing, who is now looking very, very comfortably at his great friend, Moses Mendelssohn, who is explaining to Lafaterre why he would not convert. And on the background, we do have a painting of the uh, king of Prussia at the time. So in a sense, what you have here is you've moved away from the confrontation. Now just take a look at the two of them together. You can see what's transpired, that the later artist um, wants Mendelssohn to be the positive, not only to be sitting and listening. He wants Mendelssohn to be the figure who is presenting. Now, this is something which we will see, and I can't bring all of the works that um, show it, but there are, in later in the 19th century, we have other attempts by various figures to present this scene. In other words, the scene in which this confrontation is taking place became a very important um, moment in the history of, in the cultural history of German Jews. But I would say that it was clear from the outset that what Oppenheim wanted to emphasize and maybe what the others wanted to emphasize is the fact that the relationship between Mendelssohn and Lessing, the great figure of the German Enlightenment, that these were very close companions 
who had a very important relationship. And here you can see a different interpretation of the scene, so to speak, where Lafater has come into the house and Mendelssohn is not really even turning to him and not listening to him. But to eliminate, to illuminate how Mendelssohn figured so prominently as a representative of the highest virtues of Jewish life, I want to show you something which I um, alluded to before. And this is an image which was, again, it's something which was created this time by a Hungarian Jewish artist by the name of Ijo Kurvish. And if there are any Hungarian Jews who are listening to this lecture, I uh, ask you to, uh, I apologize for my inability to pronounce his name exactly as it should be. Kirvish was born in 1853 and died in 1917. He did several works dealing with issues related to Jewish history. And he was interested in um, portraying something which, again, as we have said before, did not actually take place. We have here a scene in which Mendelssohn has come to speak to Frederick the Great. And notice the light that is coming in from outside and is on, showed towards Mendelssohn. The arrow above points to the sculpture. Again, the imagination of Kirvish, the sculpture is the sculpture of Socrates. So he's created this scene, and it's in a sense you can say that he's trying to depict an, an encounter between Mendelssohn and Frederick the Great in the presence of another figure by the name of Baron von Fritsch, which is not important to you. And um, it's not clear exactly what um, brought Kirvish to do this, but it's quite clear that by showing Mendelssohn in this very respectable way that he's He's bending over in a gesture of fealty. He has removed his hat. Mendelssohn's in a dark cape. He's, gre he's greeted both by the king and the baron, who seem to be pleased, as you can look at their faces. The painting was in terrible condition. It's only been reconstructed recently in Hungary. And here you can see that Mendelssohn is acknowledging the superiority of the secular ruler, while his presence in their company bestows honor upon the Jews. Moreover, Kirvish was clearly aware that Mendelssohn was often called, as we have mentioned several times in this lecture, that Mendelssohn was called the Jewish Socrates, therefore the bust of Socrates. It's not as if, in other words, we don't know whether Frederick the Great had in his office the bust of Socrates. This is what the Jewish artist wanted to emphasize. And in doing so, he was clearly um, saying something about the process that was going on within Hungarian Jewish society, the process of acculturation and Magyarization. And it enables Kirvich to highlight Mendelssohn as the symbol of acculturated Judaism, highly respected by the ruling powers. Now, this is very important, that he's using Mendelssohn He's using Mendelssohn in this fabricated situation <coughs> to show that Jewish culture and history can go together with social integration. It was the public and monarchical respect that Mendelssohn was granted that was critical, whereas for Oppenheim and Katzenstein, it remained more in the realm of Mendelssohn's inner strength and his honored friendship with the distinguished Enlightenment writer Lessing. Now, as I turn to the end of the lecture, I'm going to mention some other images of Mendelssohn, and one can, of course, go into many others. Now, this is very complicated for you to see, but it's important for me to emphasize. Mendelssohn here is included in a, in a great mural 
of the Royal Society of Arts by the English historical painter James Barry. It's called Elysium and Tartarus or the State of Final Retribution. It includes some 125 identifiable men and women. Barry painted the murals during the lifetime of Mendelssohn between 1777 and 1784 and entitled them in common enlightenment fashion as the progress of human culture. But the image of Mendelssohn he added after Mendelssohn died, and you can see him there, hopefully, and it was because he had read about Mendelssohn's work, which was translated into English, he was very impressed, and he called him a most extraordinary individual and the embodiment of humanity's finest cultural expression. But Mendelssohn was the only Jew Jewish personality in this great mural. He is together with many scientists and philosophers who fought and died for liberty and enabled the arts to flourish. Now, I'm going to move over from this and just mention to you that in the le ne next lecture that you're going to hear from me, those of you who will maintain uh, participation, you'll see that Mendelssohn even appeared in a joint uh, work by a Jewish beetle or teacher of the second half of the 19th century by the name of Israel Wiesen. He did a series of works on important Jewish men. And I mentioned to all the ladies in the audience that unfortunately in none of the works by Wiesen that we will be seeing in the next lecture, um, there are no women. But if you look at the men here, in two different places you see Mendelssohn on the top. One, which I will discuss more, which is very interesting, you see Mendelssohn next to Benedict Spinoza. So in a sense, people who were trying to kind of create a museum without walls always thought of Mendelssohn. And so the uh, former in the former um, exhibition in the Jewish Museum in Berlin, not, I don't know if it's still there now, but they've, as they have redone the former exhibition in the Berlin Jewish Museum, you could have, after you have gone through many different aspects of the history of Berlin uh, Jewry, you would encounter this machine. And what you could do is you could place a coin in the machine and you could then take home with you a personal medal of Moses Mendelssohn. Basically, I think that they were saying that if there is one figure who distinguishes Berlin Jewry more than any other, it was the distinguished philosopher. So like when your children or grandchildren have parties and they want to come home with something, here, after going through the museum and you put in, I think it was maybe two euros, you could have a Mendelssohn, you could have a Mendelssohn as a souvenir of your visit to the museum and hopefully a pleasant memory of this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.